Southern Fraud True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. In early spring of 1991, the Troop County Sheriff's Department had a lot on their plate. In late March, they were investigating the murder of a woman named Marcy. She was 79 years old, and someone had shot her in the head. Marcy's sister and brother-in-law found her body. They became worried after they hadn't heard from her in a while. After Marcy's body was found, the case was cold almost from the beginning. There was no evidence of forced entry. There were no signs that anything was stolen. There was no murder weapon. The doors were locked. Everyone was baffled. Troop County residents were shocked because Marcy's case was eerily similar to that of another Troop County homicide, one that happened that same year, only one month earlier in February of 1991. Just like Marcy, an older woman was shot in the head. No murder weapon was found. But unlike Marcy's case, which went cold, the questions surrounding this victim would be answered in about a week. And those answers would bring a well-respected family to its knees. Welcome to episode 188, The Murder of Margaret Abernathy. On Monday, February 4th, 1991, 40-year-old Priscilla Matula went to work at about 7.20 in the morning. Priscilla was always an early riser. She had to be. She owned a car dealership with her husband, Nick, in the small town of LaGrange, Georgia. Well, with about 25,000 residents at that time, and 30 now, it is technically a small city. But it's continuously referred to as a small town by everyone in this episode the kind of place where everyone knew everyone. Together, Priscilla and Nick were responsible for their car dealership's success and its failure, but that was okay. Priscilla understood the nonstop grind that went hand in hand with owning a car dealership. Her family had always been in the car business. In fact, her mother and late father, Margaret and Bill Abernathy, had owned their very own dealership for much of Priscilla's life. And out of Margaret and Bill's three children, Priscilla was always the most interested in her parents' car business. But she wasn't running their dealership. That had been sold years ago. Still, Priscilla was considered the natural heir to the car dealership throne. But heavy is the head that wears the crown. And so Priscilla was up and at them bright and early almost every day to make sure her car business was running smoothly. She always walked through her dealership's doors at about 8 a.m., and this particular Monday was no different. But even though Priscilla's routine seemed identical, her demeanor was different, off. It felt like nothing was going Priscilla's way. That morning, she had to leave the dealership to go to the bank. That's always a hassle. And a few hours later, she had to run an errand to the post office. But when she got there, the line was out the building. According to Priscilla, she just drove around the block and then went straight back to work. She planned to handle her post office to-do list later. After returning to the dealership, Priscilla had even more to worry about. Every morning, her mother Margaret would call to check in. Sometimes she would even stop by the dealership. But today, Margaret had not called, and she had not stopped by. Her absence was strange. When Priscilla called her mother to see what was wrong, Margaret didn't answer the phone. This caused Priscilla deep concern and she expressed as much to her employees. Frantic, she called her mother again and again, but no matter how many times she called, no one answered the phone. Now she was starting to panic. She called friends and family who might have heard from Margaret, but nobody knew anything. By about noon, word was spreading throughout the close-knit town of LaGrange, Georgia. Most everyone knew Priscilla was searching for her mother. But still, everything was probably fine, Maybe Margaret had a wild hair and was taking a nice long stroll around a park. After all, Priscilla wasn't her keeper, and Margaret was 66 years old and fit as a fiddle. She could take care of herself. Linda Frazier worked at Priscilla's car dealership, and she could tell Priscilla was in a tizzy about her mother. When she told Linda she was going over to her mom's house on her lunch break to check on her, 
Linda offered to go with her. She wanted to be there to support Priscilla, especially on the off chance that something had actually happened. But Priscilla said no. She insisted she would be fine going to her mother's house alone. She pulled into her mother's long driveway at about 12.25 p.m. and let herself into the front door. It was a large home with a brick facade, four bedrooms, two bathrooms, and a green yard. Right away, she noticed the house was oddly dark. All the lights were off. She said she yelled out to her mother, but no one responded. So she let herself in and began looking around. And that's when she saw that the house had been ransacked. Someone had pulled drawers out and thrown clothes on the floor. And in the bathroom, 66-year-old Margaret Abernathy's still body was lying on the floor. Blood was everywhere. Priscilla immediately called 911 and she told the operator that her mother's house had been robbed and her mother was hurt. When the medics first arrived on the scene, they weren't entirely sure what was wrong with Margaret. There was blood everywhere, yes, but no clear origin of that blood. Still, Margaret was obviously not okay. She was unconscious and unmoving. She made a few sounds that were described as light snoring, but she couldn't communicate. The emergency responders took Margaret to the local hospital, West Georgia Medical Center, and Priscilla rode with her in the ambulance. At the hospital, doctors were shocked to discover that Margaret had sustained two gunshot wounds to the back of her head, and everyone naturally assumed that this was a tragic case of a robbery gone wrong. The bullets were still embedded in her body. That's how the doctors could tell they were very small bullets, only 22 caliber. The bullets were so small that the first one from the first gunshot hadn't even penetrated Margaret's skull. It was stuck underneath her skin. On its own, this bullet wouldn't have been lethal. After some healing, Margaret would have been fine. But the second bullet, well, that was the deadly one. It had perforated Margaret's brainstem, the part of the brain that controlled Margaret's most important functions, like her breathing, consciousness, and motor functions. And as a result, Margaret was in a coma, one that the doctors believed she would never wake up from. She had a consistent heartbeat, but no brain activity. Priscilla, her friends, and numerous family members were waiting outside of Margaret's hospital room. Upon hearing that she would die, they were distraught. At 3.15 on February 4th, 1991, Margaret Abernathy was removed from life support and pronounced dead. I'm sure the officers who arrived at Margaret's home were expecting an open and shut case. After all, this was obviously a home invasion gone wrong. Margaret was widely known as a very successful businesswoman. People knew she had money, and a lot of it. Plus, her house was in shambles. A window in the back door had been broken, presumably so the burglar could reach in and unlock it. And many of Margaret's items, including her luxurious meat coat, appeared to be missing too. And not long before this, there had been another armed robbery on the same road that Margaret lived on. A man had entered a convenience store with a handgun and demanded cash from the female clerk. He even tried to force the store clerk into his pickup truck, but she escaped and the man fled the scene. But as law enforcement officers began cataloging the evidence, they noticed some irregularities. For example, Margaret's stolen items they weren't actually stolen at all. In fact, almost nothing was missing from Margaret's home. Sure, some stuff had been tossed about and the mink coat was gone, but everything else, it was still there. Whoever was in Margaret's home had gathered up some expensive clothing, but for some reason, they had left it behind. And the clothes weren't dropped in a heap on the floor as if a startled robber had to get away fast. They were folded and neatly arranged. Someone had taken great care with them. They certainly weren't in a hurry or worried about being caught. Plus, there was a slew of expensive jewelry and pricey electronics, like TVs, radios, and cameras, laying out in the open that were completely untouched. And then there was the broken back door window. Initially, investigators thought this was how the robber got into Margaret's home. Smash glass, reach inside, unlock the door, and boom, you're in. But the hole in the window's glass was small. 
so small that it would have been impossible for someone to reach through it and unlock the back door from the inside. Plus, most of the shattered glass was on the outside of the house, not the inside, as if someone was standing inside Margaret's home when they broke the window. Maybe, the police began to wonder, this wasn't a robbery. Maybe this was something far more nefarious. And perhaps the final nail in the coffin for the authorities' suspicion was this. Only one item, besides the mink coat, was actually missing from Margaret's home. And that item was a Derringer. A Derringer, if you don't know, is a short-barreled pistol that's small enough to fit into a woman's handbag. And this specific one used 22 caliber bullets, the same kind of bullets the doctors had found in Margaret's body. Now the police were left to question, if this wasn't a robbery gone wrong, why was Margaret murdered? Margaret Christine Boyd was born on April 28, 1924, to parents William and Sally in Jackson, Georgia. As one of six children, her childhood home was probably always bustling and moving. In fact, Margaret's whole life seemed characterized by movement. Over the course of her life, she would move from one Georgia town to the next, from Jackson to Cobb, from Cobb to Fulton, from Fulton to Roswell. Finally, in 1951, Margaret settled in LaGrange, Georgia with her husband. And that husband was William Alec Abernathy. He went by Bill. Bill and Margaret had married sometime in their late teens or early 20s, and he was a great match for Margaret. Born on November 13, 1921, Bill was three years older than Margaret. And like Margaret, he had five siblings. Also like Margaret, Bill was full of youth, passion, and kindness. The young couple had so many ideas for the future. But first, Bill was in the Army, and he served in World War II. In August of 1948, 24-year-old Margaret and 27-year-old Bill had their first child, a son named William Alec Abernathy Jr. He went by Alec. And then in 1952, little Priscilla Christina Abernathy was born. And eight years later, in November of 1960, Margaret and Bill had their second daughter, Melody. This would be their third and final child. Priscilla and her two siblings mostly grew up in LaGrange. There, the Abernathy family built a reputation as honest, hardworking folks. Both Margaret and Bill attended the East Vernon Baptist Church, and Margaret was also involved in the LaGrange Pilot Club. Meanwhile, Bill was a member of the Moose and Elks Club and the Optimist Club. Margaret and Bill owned a farm, a real estate company, and of course, the car dealership. Margaret handled the bookkeeping and business end of things. Bill handled sales and service. But the Abernathys weren't just savvy business people. They were also generous with their time. They went out of their way to serve on every committee or board they possibly could. According to their grandchild, Christy Lumpkin's interviews with Snapped, Margaret and Bill wanted to help their lovely little town whenever they could, and they did. Christy said, it was a small town, but they were a part of everything, whether it was being on the board for the local electric company or the board of commissioners. Margaret was also very much the matriarch of their larger family, planning Sunday dinners, vacations, and family reunions. She was loved by her family and friends as much as she was respected in the community. Priscilla and her siblings, in many ways, had an ideal childhood. Since Margaret and Bill were so financially successful, their three children hardly ever wanted for anything. And when Margaret's family members spoke with Snapped, they recalled that she was more than happy to help her children with money. After all, she and Bill had so much of it. And Margaret wanted her children to achieve their dreams. She understood there was no better tool than money to get her kids where they wanted to go. But the Abernathys, foremost, set an example as hard workers and encouraged the kids to work at the family business. Throughout their childhood and teenage years, Margaret and Bill's three kids helped out at the car dealership off and on. And Priscilla really took to the family car business, far more than her older brother or younger sister. After a while, Priscilla seemed like she was going to make a great businesswoman. She was soft-spoken, but she was also really easy to get along with. And she knew the right questions to ask her parents it was clear she could probably make a career out of owning her own car dealership one day. 
When Priscilla married her first husband, it seemed like life was going as planned. She was helping at her parents' dealership. She had started a family with two children of her own, but then her first husband unexpectedly died. Priscilla was, of course, shaken, heartbroken, distraught. Suddenly, she was a widow, and in addition to that, she was the single mother of two young children. Priscilla leaned on her parents for support, and especially her mother, Margaret. Margaret was her anchor, emotionally and financially, and these troubling times brought them closer than ever. Over time, they spent so much time together that Priscilla became integral to Margaret's financial dealings. They appeared to be a dynamic business duo, mother and daughter, master and apprentice, mentor and protege. According to Margaret's granddaughter, Christy Lumpkin, they were inseparable. In the 1980s, Priscilla was in her late 20s and early 30s, and that's when she began dating a new man. His name was Nick Matula, and he was about five years younger than her. And like Priscilla, he had also spent most of his life in LaGrange. But unlike Priscilla, Nick wasn't easy to get along with. Those who knew him told Snapped that he was hard-headed. He struggled to see new perspectives. But maybe Nick wasn't like that with Priscilla, or maybe Priscilla saw Nick's potential. Because after a suitable courtship, they got married. And it was then that Nick started working at Priscilla's parents' car dealership. In 1989, Priscilla's father, Bill, began having severe health issues. His diabetes were causing congestive heart failure. And after a while, it became apparent that Bill didn't have long for this world. And so the Abernathy family banded together in support. No one missed Sunday night dinner to see Bill. Meanwhile, his health continued to decline. Their granddaughter said that Bill started having a hard time doing everyday tasks. Eventually, he couldn't even leave his bedroom. And in March 1990, Bill died. He was only 68 years old. After his death, the newly widowed Margaret decided to retire. So she sold the car dealership. And Priscilla saw this as an opportunity. She wanted to start a car dealership of her own, just as her parents had. She had been in the business for over a decade. She could do this and Priscilla would follow in her parents' footsteps by taking on the car dealership with her husband, Nick. But Priscilla and Nick couldn't afford to buy a dealership on their own, so they asked Margaret for help, and she was happy to invest in her daughter's new venture. She loaned Priscilla and Nick about $130,000. In today's money, that's almost $290,000. And Margaret also co-signed many of Priscilla and Nick's business loans. She even put up her own house and a CD, or Certificate of Deposit, up as collateral. Margaret was putting a huge amount of trust in Priscilla and Nick. She had faith that her daughter's new dealership would be successful. And if it wasn't successful, well, Margaret could lose a lot of money and her home. Priscilla and Nick bought a dealership called Economy Jeep on New Franklin Road. Luckily, it appeared as if everything was going well. Priscilla ran the administrative parts of the business. She paid the bills, ordered the parts, and handled the logistics. And Nick handled the service side of things. Priscilla often went to her mother for advice, and Margaret was glad to give it. Of course, she had even more writing on the investment than the Matulas did. According to Margaret's friend Bob Cole, who spoke with Snapped, she would stop by the dealership to make sure everything was going smoothly. He said... She wanted to see exactly what was going on, what was being done, who was doing what. And as far as Margaret could tell, the finances were doing just fine. But not everything was as it seemed. On Friday, February 1st, 1991, Margaret discovered something troubling. Priscilla and Nick had not been making their business loan payments. Some of the dealership's customers had been affected, and of course the bank wasn't too happy either. At first, Margaret was probably just a little trouble. Maybe she thought it was all a mistake. But as she continued digging into the business finances, she became positively livid. She realized that Priscilla had been forging her signature to steal money from her real estate company. And this wasn't just a one-time thing. Priscilla had been doing it for a while. The next day, Saturday, February 2nd, 1991, Margaret went to the bank. She was very upset. She said something about her blood pressure going up as a result of all of this, 
and she was adamant that she wanted to remove Priscilla's name from her real estate business checking account. But since it was a Saturday, they didn't have the right people there to help Margaret. The bank officials told her she would have to come back on Monday to complete the process of removing Priscilla from her account. But come Monday morning, Margaret would be dead. 66-year-old Margaret Abernathy's funeral was held three days after her death at 4 p.m. on Thursday, February 7th. The service was held at the East Vernon Baptist Church, of which Margaret had been a member for many years. She was buried next to her beloved husband, Bill, in the Shadow Lawn Cemetery of LaGrange, Georgia. Her funeral was well attended. The people of LaGrange adored her, and much of Margaret's family was there too. She was, and is, dearly missed. Meanwhile, the police were investigating Margaret's murder. By now, they knew this was no robbery, and the staged crime scene suggested that someone close to Margaret had killed her. Someone who could easily enter the house, knew she owned a small pistol, and wanted her dead for personal reasons. On Margaret's mattress and pillow was a large red blood stain. From this, investigators reasoned that Margaret was first shot in the head while she was asleep. And since her unmoving body was found in the bathroom, she must have somehow gotten herself to the bathroom after the first gunshot wound. That made sense with the medical reports about Margaret's injuries. The first gunshot wasn't fatal. It hadn't even penetrated her skull. In the bathroom, the police found bloody toilet paper strewn everywhere. She must have woken up and tried to go stop the bleeding before her killer realized she wasn't dead. And then she was shot a second time in the bathroom, again from behind. This second bullet, as we know, hit Margaret's brainstem. She would have been immediately immobilized. And that's how she was found by Priscilla hours later. During Priscilla's police interviews, she was asked to walk the officers through how she had discovered her mother. In her answers, Priscilla was detailed, extremely detailed, like too detailed. Prosecutor Anna Cobb Allen said the amount of detail she gave seemed excessive. She had a narrative that she wanted to put forth. Priscilla told the investigators about the specific highways she took, how often she took those highways, getting stuck behind school buses, having to leave the dealership for the bank, leaving the dealership for the post office, driving around the post office's block multiple times as she realized the line was too long. She went on and on and on. But Priscilla wasn't the only person close to Margaret acting suspicious. When Priscilla's husband Nick spoke to the police, he shared some very interesting information about her older brother, Alec. According to Nick, Alec was in deep financial trouble and badly needed money. And Nick said that Alec told him he was looking forward to inheriting his parents' money when they died. It would help him clear his debt and get him out of the red. And this appeared to be true. Alec was in financial trouble and could have been motivated to kill Margaret for an early inheritance. Plus, Alec was also the financial beneficiary of one of Margaret's insurance policies. He was going to get about $40,000. That's just shy of 90000 today. With this new information, the police considered Alec a person of interest in his mother's murder. But lucky for him, he had an airtight alibi. On the morning Margaret was shot, Alec was helping out at Priscilla's car dealership. He had been there the entire time. There was no way he could have gotten to Margaret's house to kill her. And there was another suspicious person. His name was Diaka Andromalus. Diaka was a family friend, and he had moved in with Margaret and Bill two years earlier when Bill's health first began to deteriorate. He was a bigger guy who could help Bill get around the house more easily. John Lotz, one of Margaret's grandkids, said Diaka was a gentle giant. After Bill passed, Diaka remained Margaret's roommate. He would have known the layout of her home, and he would have had a key, and he would have known that she kept a Derringer. When the police tried to find Diaka, they couldn't. He also worked at a car dealership, but it wasn't the one Priscilla owned. Upon hearing that Diaka was close to Margaret and would have had access to her home, they contacted his workplace. They wanted to talk to him. But on the same Monday that Margaret was killed, Diaka wasn't at work. In fact, his boss had no idea where he was. 
Diaka had been there that morning, but now he had vanished. This seemed like he was hiding something. Had he murdered Margaret and fled? The police soon learned the answer to that question. Diaka hadn't really gone anywhere. He had stepped out on his lunch break to go to an interview at yet another car dealership. That was why he hadn't told his boss where he was. He knew he would be fired if his supervisor found out he was trying to get a new job elsewhere. Plus, when the authorities told Diaka about Margaret's murder, he broke down. He began crying. Between Diaka's emotional response to Margaret's death and the fact that he hadn't left for his interview until after the time Margaret would have been killed, the police believed him. Diaka had nothing to do with Margaret's murder. As far as the police could tell, Margaret had no known enemies, and everyone seemed to have an alibi during the time of her murder. Everyone except Priscilla. Several days after the murder, the authorities received an anonymous tip. The tipster worked at a local bank called the Bank of Troop County, and this person told the police how, two days before Margaret died, she had tried to remove Priscilla from the real estate checking account I mentioned before. This bank worker told the police officers that Margaret was distressed and inconsolable when she was at the bank. She needed Priscilla out of her finances now. Based on this information, the police began looking at Priscilla and her dealership's finances. And, as it turns out, Priscilla and her husband's car business was not as successful as they had suggested. They had had to take out additional loans to stay afloat. After receiving this intel from the anonymous bank worker, the local police called the Georgia Bureau of Investigation for help. So the GBI sent a financial expert. That expert combed through Margaret's records and found Priscilla's schemes. They discovered that Priscilla had been doing an illegal practice known as check kiting to pay the car dealership's bills. Check kiting is often described as robbing Peter to pay Paul. It happens when a person has two or more bank accounts. The person writes one check from bank account A to their other account, bank account B. Then they go to bank B and cash a check. And in the time it takes for bank account B to make sure the funds are in bank account A, the money is already gone. Basically, it's fraud, and Priscilla was in big trouble. She would write checks as large as $30,000, $67,000 in today's money, to make it appear as if her car dealership had a positive cash flow. But they didn't. Their cash flow was, in fact, negative. And so at this point, Priscilla became the investigator's prime suspect. And then another witness came forward. A woman named Paige Rester worked as a clerk at a convenience store very close to Margaret's home. And she had seen Priscilla at this convenience store at around 7.15 a.m. on the morning of Margaret's murder. She said Priscilla looked upset and distracted. And she said she had known Priscilla for several years, so she recognized her. If you'll remember, 7.15 a.m. was around the time Priscilla said she was going to work. She hadn't told the police that she was anywhere near her mother's house. And when she arrived at the car dealership, it was actually about 8.15 a.m., not 8 a.m. as Priscilla had told the police earlier. Then she left the dealership for the post office at 10 a.m. But at this exact moment, another witness saw Priscilla, and she wasn't circling the post office block freaking out about long lines. This witness just happened to be viewing a rental property across the street from Margaret's home. And the witness told authorities that they saw Priscilla's car parked in Margaret's driveway at 10 a.m. on the same Monday that Margaret was killed. They also claimed that they heard a gunshot at around 10 a.m. that day. And at the time of the gunshot, the car was still in the driveway. In the moment, the witness did not even think to call the police about the gunshot. Margaret's home was in rural Troop County, and it wasn't uncommon for people to use their firearms recreationally, just for fun. This wasn't a suburban area where homes were packed together. There were a lot of wide open spaces and fields where you could target shoot safely. Next, the police were able to confirm that Priscilla was at the car dealership at 10.30 a.m. She left again at noon to check on Margaret, and at about 12.25 p.m., she called 911 to report that her mother was injured. Over the course of this investigation, Priscilla spoke to the police three times. Throughout those interviews, 
they realized that her very detailed stories kept changing. And in one of her final interviews, Priscilla insisted that she hadn't done anything wrong, not with anything relating to her mother, and certainly not with the finances of her dealership. According to an investigator's interviews with Snapped, Priscilla was certain that, since she owned the bank account she used when check-kiting, what she was doing was totally legal, but it wasn't. On Tuesday, February 12th of 1991, 40-year-old Priscilla Matula was arrested for murdering her mother, 66-year-old Margaret Abernathy. She was held in the Troop County Jail until her bond of $100,000 was posted. And then she was out until her trial. She continued to deny having anything to do with the murder, and she also denied committing any check fraud. While awaiting her trial date, Priscilla actually called the convenience store worker witness. She tried to convince Paige Rester that she had misremembered the day, that Priscilla was in the store on a different day, not Monday, February 4th. According to the prosecuting attorney, Anna Cobb Allen, Priscilla was pushy and cagey. She wanted to adjust this witness's memory. Not a good look for trial. Priscilla's trial began in August of 1992, about a year and a half after her mother was murdered. According to Mike Newsom, a former Troop County investigator, this was a tricky case for the state prosecutors. Technically, all of the available evidence was circumstantial. They never found the murder weapon. And of course, nobody had actually seen Priscilla kill Margaret. But many trials come down to circumstantial evidence. It is still evidence. However, not finding the murder weapon can definitely be a challenge. But still, the prosecution was confident they would succeed. They proposed that after Margaret realized she couldn't remove Priscilla from her bank account on Saturday, she confronted her daughter. She told Priscilla she was cutting her off financially, and that's why Priscilla decided she had to kill her mother. The situation was dire. Without Margaret's financial support, Priscilla and Nick would be ruined. They would have lost everything. Priscilla knew she had to stop her mother from going to the bank on Monday. She could not be removed from her mother's accounts. Prosecutor Anna Cobb Allen said they were in the red, and once she realized they had no financial safety net beyond Mrs. Abernathy, that was it. The only thing she could do was kill her mother so she could still have access to her money. Then, in the early morning hours of Monday, February 4th, Priscilla snuck into Margaret's house while she was sleeping. Then she shot her mother twice in the head. Thinking she was dead or dying, Priscilla then left and went to work. Later that morning, Priscilla returned to her mother's house to stage the crime scene. She found her mother alive in the bathroom, so she shot her again, this time mortally wounding her. Prosecutor Anna Cobb Allen said the most difficult hurdle of the case wasn't convincing the jury to trust the evidence. It was convincing them that a daughter could kill her own mother. She told Snapped, a daughter killing her mother is, to me, unimaginable. You have to go to a really dark place to understand this. And it really was a cold-blooded killing. She had to shoot her mother twice. The prosecution was also tasked with proving that Priscilla had committed fraud. They showed that Priscilla had forged Margaret's name on checks and other financial paperwork, equaling about $110,000. That's about $250,000 today. Priscilla's defense leaned heavily on the fact that this case was entirely circumstantial. No one had seen any of these actions take place. But those arguments weren't nearly as compelling as the prosecution's. Take, for example, the eyewitness testimony of an emergency room nurse. The nurse had seen that Priscilla was distraught upon learning that her unresponsive mother would die. According to the nurse, Priscilla exclaimed, Oh my God, what have I done? And then her husband, Nick, said, Shut your damn face. Later, after Nick left, the nurse again heard Priscilla repeat, Oh my God, what have I done? A brief sidebar. I've always wondered about Priscilla's husband, Nick Matula's role in this case. Did he pressure Priscilla to kill her mother to save them from financial ruin? When the papers reported Priscilla's arrest on Wednesday, the 13th, the sheriff said that he did not rule out the possibility of more arrests in the case. But as far as I can tell, Nick was never arrested for anything related to Margaret's murder. 
But weirdly enough, 35-year-old Nick Matula and Priscilla's older brother, 42-year-old Alec, were arrested mere days after Priscilla anyway for a completely unrelated crime. The crime was described by the Ledger Inquirer as, quote, damage to property in connection with the Georgia Power Company's electrical transformers. Nick and Alec allegedly caused $275,000 worth of damage when they used rifles to shoot out Georgia Power's transformers. Lots of people lost power for about eight hours. I'm not sure why they would allegedly do that. Hell, I'm not sure that the case was even resolved. It's a weird footnote in an already strange, tangled case. Incidentally, Alec died young in March of 1995 at the age of 46. And Melody, the youngest of the Abernathy siblings, also died fairly young at age 56 in 2017. Both are buried near their parents in Shadow Lawn Cemetery. As far as I can tell, the newspapers did not mention Nick and Alec's crime again. They instead focused on Priscilla's juicier story. And on August 28th of 1992, the jury found 41-year-old Priscilla Christina Matula guilty of murder and six counts of felony forgery. This case shook the LaGrange, Georgia community. Margaret Abernathy was a high-profile woman. Everyone knew who she was, and everyone knew the Abernathys and purportedly the Matulas as happy, healthy, and quite frankly, rich. So for Margaret to be killed by her own daughter for money, it seemed impossible. Margaret's friend, Bob Cole, told Snapped, I've always thought that for that instant, Priscilla lost her mind. And Margaret's death deeply shook the Abernathy clan. Granddaughter Christy Lumpkin said, whenever Nanny was killed, our family just died. No more family reunions or family vacations. They drifted apart. It wasn't just Priscilla's awful act. It was losing Margaret. She was the glue. She was the strong matriarch who held everything and everyone together. Family had meant everything to her. And then she was shot in cold blood by her own daughter. Priscilla was sentenced to life in prison for Margaret's murder and five years for each count of forgery. All sentences would be served concurrently. After a time, Priscilla would become eligible for parole. And in May of 2015, Priscilla Matula was released from prison after serving 23 years of her sentence. Today, she is around 71 years old, five years older than her mother when she shot her to death. Southern Fraud True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched and written by Andrea Marshbank with additional research and writing by myself, And of course, all editorial opinions are my own. Southern Fred's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. Today's episode was edited and mixed by Brandon Sheck Snyder of Southern Gothic and Erica Kelly. If you have any case suggestions, please go to my website and click on the listener suggestion tab or email sftcresearch at gmail.com. Please remember that I do not accept suggestions on social media private messages. The research tab on southernfriedtruecrime.com is the best way for me to get those little-known cases y'all always send me. But please come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. I much prefer spending my social media time in our lovely group. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on all large platforms like iHeart, Spotify, Amazon, Audible, and YouTube. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.